Thank you so much. Um, as mentioned, I'm Bridget Tingandu. I'm a senior lecturer in social work at the University of Kent. Um, so very close to uh, the border of um, Dover and, uh, and Calais. So the theme I will be talking about today around asylum seekers and refugees is not just sort of close to my heart, but close proximity to where I live. I, I am 10 miles away from, from Dover. Um, so really when, when we're talking about asylum seekers and refugees, I, I'm in the heart of it. So um, it's, it's very close to me. I'm going to talk about um, internationalization and social work, really kind of um, from, from a perspective of an invitation of conversation, because when, when we're thinking about things, uh, it's not always that you have the answers. But actually, the more you talk about with people, the more things become clearer. And then I'll move on to look at um, a research project that I've just completed with volunteers, with social workers without borders, but also who are local authority social workers uh, in the UK. And that is important because of their dual nature of, uh, of the work they're doing. So that will be the latter part of my, of my presentation. So just a, probably an overview of, of what this will be. Um, I will talk a little bit about the scale of the problem because I think it's helpful to always put things into a bit of perspective. When we're talking about asylum seekers, what, what are we actually seeing? Now that would be limited to, to, to the UK context or England, the English context, but I hope it sets kind of a tone for us to think about, um, especially as social scientists, um, especially as social workers, when we are hearing narratives about asylum seekers and refugees, do we just accept that or do we interrogate that a little bit more to actually find out what is actually happening and what is the data telling us? So for me, that is a helpful context. I refer to bordering and hostile environments. In the UK, the term or concept of hostile environments is, is, is very um, um, uh, is very familiar. It's it's in it's in policy documents, it's in government rhetoric, and as social workers, we're always hearing this, this word of hostile environment. And then I'll move on to talk about the case study of social workers without borders. Um, and I think it, it's helpful sometimes to kind of think about uh, some of the issues in our communities or in society. Can we do something? Can we respond as social workers? Or do we always sit back and, 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 and watch things happen in front of us? And I, I think there is something we can perhaps learn from social workers without borders. And I say that um, even as somebody who can stand back from it as a, as a member of Social Workers Without Borders, and then offer some conclusions uh, about critical radical social work uh, of global importance and what that could mean for an international social work or internationalization of social work, uh, in particular practice and activism. So who am I? Why did I become an activist? Well, first and foremost, being um, a woman of color, I was born in Zambia uh, many years ago, I won't say how long ago, um, and I studied my social work in Botswana. So that was my first interaction with the visa process and being framed as a migrant. And when I was a student in Botswana studying for a degree in social work, I went on placement. My first placement was with the United Nations Development Program, I think they were called UNDP at that time. And I was placed there because I could not speak the, the local language, Setswana, fluently. So I needed to be in a placement where English was spoken, being an international student. Um, and it was, it was the first time they had a student. They really didn't know what I needed to be doing on placement. So I was placed with the refugee resettlement scheme. And there was my first interaction with asylum seekers and refugees. I was very taken aback or surprised that there were people arriving from Yugoslavia seeking asylum in Botswana, Southern Africa. I don't have the map, the world map, but you probably can just imagine where Yugoslavia is and, and Botswana is right um, you know, down the south of, uh, of Africa. And I was thinking, but why are people traveling this far to seek security 
why can why can't you stay in your home country or why can't you go to a closer place to seek refuge i had no idea or had very little understanding of that but something clicked in my brain to say what should we be doing if i'm going to be a social worker what does this mean for me but at that time the link between social work and activism wasn't there not the way it is now and it has been a learning process i probably became more of an activist um, during as a student in my final year because of the impact hiv aids had on sub-saharan africa i I'm, I'm i'm a child of hiv aids i think we started hearing of hiv aids when i was about 10 11 years old so most of my life has lived with hiv aids and at that time it was the priority uh it was the priority issue so asylum seekers and refugees fell back on on on, on our agenda so i started taking part in what you might call protests, uh, speaking out about human rights on people's, uh, for people uh, living with HIV. And for me, that was a very clear link to the teachings of Jane Addams, inspirations of activism, and also what we see today about actually, you know, radical social work reminds us about the meaningful uh, practice, that meaningful practice should always incorporate elements of political action. So that aspect of the doing is very central to, to the work I do and what I'm going to talk about today. So in the background there in the picture, you might see me somewhere smiling, that's me. And this was the first inauguration of Social Workers Without Borders in 2016. Um, and and we're, still, we're, still, we're still continuing. So what is this picture? Quite often, not just in the UK, but I think across the, uh, Europe, we hear about there is a problem, there is a crisis. Um, and, and that terminology sometimes can send a, a fear, especially for us practitioners, social workers. Goodness, it's too big, we can't do anything about it. But I just thought on this slide, perhaps bring it a little bit smaller to think about when we're saying a problem, how, how big is this problem? And it was interesting to look at just some very basic statistics in relation to the UK. We, we hear a lot in the UK about the many asylum seekers arriving. There's so many refugees are arriving. Uh, almost every other day on my local news is about the numbers of asylum seekers that have crossed the channel and how these numbers are not, you know, cannot be compared to what has happened before. But the question for me is really, is, is this the real picture? So if you look at 2020, just as an example, you know, look at the UK and uh, the, the numbers of uh, first time asylum applicants. Germany is leading there. And the UK is just 31,752. That an example is reflective. You know, we see this uh, year after year that the UK is not as, as high as one is meant to believe. 85% of all refugees live in developing countries. And yet we have this narrative that a lot of people are arriving in Europe, a lot of people arriving in, in the UK seeking asylum. But what is also interesting, and I'll talk about this later in terms of social workers without borders work, is that the UK has the highest rate of refusal of first time asylum applications. And the work I do with social workers without borders fits in that point three. We see a lot of referrals by solicitors to our organization to help support with assessments to appeal uh, first time up asylum uh, rejected uh, asylum applications. So that's just a helpful way to think about the context. Sorry, can I just also remind, you know, if there's a way of reminding me about time, please uh, do not hesitate so that we have time for discussions so I can go on talking and, 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 and forget the clock. Okay. Thank you. The hostile environment. 2012, Theresa May uh, was Home Secretary, and she made this statement which continues to resonate in uh, UK politics. 
that her aim was to create in Britain a really hostile environment for illegal immigrants. Now that terminology is interesting, illegal immigrants, but what it forgets to uh, what what it forgets to do is actually unpick what what that actually means. Everyone has been put into sort of one category, your illegal immigrants, even people who are fleeing persecution. So terminology becomes problematic there as well. What we don't want, she said, is a situation where people think that they can come here and overstay because they are able to access everything they need. There's been this association that people seeking uh, refuge, people migrating, are coming to the UK because of the uh, good welfare system uh, that they are provided with. And we question that really, that that's, 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 not, that's not the whole story. But the, the hostile environment continues to influence uh, immigration policies uh, in our country. But it has also fueled, I think, a rise in white nationalist uh, uh, rhetoric. Um, when we think about white nationalists and, and the hostile environments, it's people feeling that they're probably being squeezed out by migrants. Uh, people are arriving to take our jobs, people are arriving to take our services, and, and we're being squeezed out. In particular, we the white people, the indigenous white people are being squeezed out. So when you add those two elements, it creates a negative environment for asylum seekers and refugees. And that's important for social work, especially when we are so well embedded in social justice and human rights. We're currently going through what is called a new plan for immigration um, proposals for the Nationality and Borders Bill 2021. And uh, Social Workers was, uh, Without Borders uh, took part in a consultation and we fed back to the government about how unhappy we are with some of the proposals. Mm -hmm. But just a basic um, example of what is being proposed is that means of arrival will determine how worthy the person is of protection in the UK. So if you're arriving through resettlement schemes, you're likely to be favored in terms of getting support. But if you're, like, if you're arriving through a boat uh, on the Dover shores, the way you arrive in the country will determine what kind of support you get. That is very problematic and has been called into question by the UN Refugees Con uh, Convention as well. So these policies are aiming to drive or constrain as much as possible people who are arriving in our country. Um, and, and social workers, we need to speak out uh, on this. Uh, just about two weeks ago, um, Social Workers Without Borders and Social Work um, Union and Social Work Action Network in the UK jointly wrote a letter to the government opposing um, uh, some of these um, uh, new cha proposed changes, but also how the government responded to Afghanistan, which is uh, pretty much my, uh, my next point. But there is also a suggestion that we have sort of like the Australian style model of housing potential asylum seekers in detention centers whilst people wait. We had an example of this in Kent and it was just disastrous but the government is pursuing, wants to pursue this route. We've had immigration removal centers, which have shown us they're not successful. The amount of uh, human hurt that creates is as unimaginable, and yet the government continues with that. The gross misuse of age assessments. This is a very contentious territory for social workers in the UK. Um, I'd be interested to hear how this is uh, uh, perhaps perceived in, in Austria and, 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 and what the uh, uh, processes are. But we struggle with age assessments and Social Workers Without Borders has taken a firm stand that we will not undertake age assessments because they're problematic. We'd rather look at the human being as a whole than try and find an age to determine whether they can get support or not. So um, the picture there you see is Priti Patel, who's, the currently, uh, who's currently the Home Secretary. Response to current uh, situation in Afghanistan, I've spoken about this, and the government's plan at the moment is that 
uh, to offer a sit uh, Afghan citizens resettlement scheme. Uh, first of all, starting with 5,000 uh, Afghans to raising that to 20,000 over uh, the next couple of years. It's a similar scheme that was offered to um, uh, those fleeing Syria a few years ago. So my question there, perhaps we can uh, try and, uh, and answer that is, why not more? Why 20,000 over a couple of years when actually people need the support now? And also we've had a footing in what has read you know, in what has led to that chaos, because we do need to call out these things. It's not, it's not like they're happening in a vacuum. So these are some of the things I think for me, just to put into context, as I move into thinking about internationalization and social work and moving to social workers without borders uh, in particular. When I was looking at uh, what has been written about internationalization and social work, it very much comes from an education perspective. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it is very much about uh, perhaps placement exchange, student exchange, yes, in some cases, protection or exchange, and that is all relevant. But my invitation here is to perhaps think about internationalization and social work at a much more broader, in a much more broader way. Can we extend practice in a way that is organized to, to be part of this internationalization? Can we think about social work practice through activism, um, being, being actually seen as opposed to, you know, being in the background. So for me, these are questions that I think Social Workers Without Borders invites us to kind of to, to really think about what, what, is, what is our role um, as, as, as social workers? Can we reach out to uh, those on the ground in Afghanistan? I know that might be difficult. Can we reach out to social work practitioners in Austria on similar issues? So there are questions there about, you know, the, this, the, of, of social work not, not being boundary, not, not being constrained by borders. That's why we are social workers without borders. We don't believe in these borders. It's not just about asylum seekers, but it's also about the way we work and how we practice. And so we can come back to that perhaps in our discussion and uh, thinkings or, of, of this. Just a brief reminder, this is our session, social work, uh, definition of social work, just social justice, human rights, collective responsibility and respect for diversities. I like that phrase. I, I always drum it into my teaching to say, let's not forget uh, these principles because they are wonderful principles, but we also need to live them. As, as practitioners. Social Workers Without Borders formed in 2016. This started as a very simple Facebook conversation between social workers, seeing what was happening in Calais uh, in 2014, 2015. And what was perceived as silence by social work professionals to say you had a, what was termed a crisis happening on the borders, but actually not re responding. So a few of us got together and started talking, and one of the things we all revisited was Paolo Freire's principles of oppression and discrimination. So Social Workers Without Borders is founded on three principles, campaigning, direct work, and education. And these are really uh, important to us as, as, a, as an organization because campaigning means we can speak out. And, and, and raise concerns as, as, as a group of social workers. Um, you know, it's also speaking out is not just about the bad things or the negative things, but praise where things are being done well. So being a kind of a critical professional friend to say things are not right, can we think about the, the ways that we, uh, the ways that we manage or respond to, to those who are uh, to those who are in crisis. So campaigning for us has included um, calling out, I'll use the phrase calling out uh, government policies. As mentioned before, we have spoken out against uh, the current uh, proposed immigration bills. We have spoken out about the government's response to what is currently happening in Afghanistan. We have spoken out about the current, uh, the government's proposed plans 
to age assessments and responding to unaccompanied asylum seeking uh, children. We've reached out to social workers. Uh, I think it was in 2019, 2020, when we had a similar kind of crisis in America on the Mexican border, showing solidarity with other social workers across the world that we are with them. Um, and and, and that, that, that really helps the, the, the change of, of, of how we uh, of how we practice and work. We have a direct work aspect to social workers without borders. I'd probably say this is the most crucial part of, 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 the, of, the, of the work we do um, as an organization. Direct work for us is emancipatory. We are very much into the principles of social work practice and of social justice. The direct work started in 2016 when we first went to Calais as a group of social workers. And one of the things we realized in Calais was that although there was quite a number of organizations working and supporting people living in Calais, there wasn't a coordinated uh, assessment process. So we were contacted by solicitors who were on the ground there and they said to us, would you be able as social workers, you've got the skills, you've got the knowledge, you've got the training, would you be able to help us undertake assessments that would help the applications for these young people to enter or reunite with their families. So this has grown now into uh, a service that we provide not only for uh, outside of the UK, but we are also providing this in the UK. We work very closely with solicitors uh, on a range of issues, including deportation. Um, we have a high number of people who are uh, deemed uh, to be deported in the UK. They may have children um, who are British born. So it's really thinking about um, Article 8 of the human rights and, and, and uh, a right to, to family life. So it is really a huge um, uh, piece of our work. Education. Education is another strand of uh, what we do in Social Workers Without Borders. And this is about developing an alternative social work narrative and practice with asylum seekers and refugees, a narrative that is positive, a narrative that is respectful, a narrative that is not blaming, because we hear a lot of that. So we try and offer something that is different. So what I'm doing today is, is a very good example of that education strand. So these are the three strands that Social Workers Without Borders um, works with. Coming to the research study, um, I undertook a research study in 20, between 2018 and 2020, before the COVID pandemic in March. And my interest in, in, in this research was really to seek the experiences of social workers who were volunteering with Social Workers Without Borders, but also working in local authorities in the United Kingdom. I'm suspecting that the setting might be the same in, in Austria, where you have a lot of social workers working in, in, in public sector or government sector or local authorities and councils. Uh, a large majority of social workers in the UK, when they qualify, they will go and work in local authorities, either children or, or adults. And, and, and those two areas have got uh, different teams or, or sections of, 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 of practice. But what I was also interested in was that they were leaving in, in a way their day job to give time to, uh, to do these assessments, to come and volunteer for an organization. And the first question I was asking them was, why are you doing it? Um, and, and this is, this is where the, um, the, the research really comes into its own. But there is also an embeddedness with social workers without borders that it is coming from a radical social work uh, approach uh, and, and systems theory to, to practice, which are, which are kind of interesting approaches to think about, especially radical social work, which in my view, I think, has become kind of silenced as an approach in social work. And we'll talk about that because there is a perception of what 
what it means, I think, to be a radical social worker and uh, being an academic. I've seen this in class. Um, just a quick example was uh, I was, I was lecturing in Oxford and uh, I was talking about radical social work. And one of my students said, ah, Bridget, you are the ones who cause trouble on the roads, always demonstrating. So immediately I thought, aha, okay, here it is then. So radical social work equals to somebody demonstrating um, uh, 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 you know, in, in, on the streets and, and, and making their voice heard. So there is, there is a sense of tension around, you know, being, being radical. And this is something that comes up for, from these practitioners as well. So I'll share with you some of the themes. Um, I interviewed 13 uh, practitioners and the analysis takes a, a, a thematic analysis and identifying some common themes uh, from this data. But for the purposes of today, I'll share with you two areas of themes. One, becoming an activist and radical social work, the, the way they feel about speaking out as social workers. And also the second, giving us that hope of reinvigorating uh, social work practice. So becoming an activist and radical social work, I think these pictures are, are, are not different, but I use the phrase speaking back um, from Sonia Stanford, an Australian academic. And she talks about speaking back as a, as a, as, as a way that practitioners, especially employed in local authority or government settings, are beginning to push back against uh, uh, um, neoliberal uh, agendas and finding a space to kind of say enough is enough or we're not, you know, uh, we, 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 we're going to challenge uh, some of these uh, policies. So being an activist for these uh, practitioners um, um, uh, is about grassroots, something that is born from the bottom going up. Social but Workers Without Borders is founded by practitioners very much from, from, uh, from a grassroots perspective. So as this practitioner says, there was no organization involved to begin with, other than setting up a group on social media, gain interest. And before you know it, we go over to the camp and see what was going on. Um, I think it is Harry Ferguson and Ian Ferguson both talk about being able to be there in the present and visualize and see what was happening. So we went to Calais to see for ourselves and so that we can speak back to what we were seeing. So that group, grassroots activism is what draws these practitioners to social workers without borders, that you can, you, you can find a space as, as, a, as a practitioner to speak out. It is about collective resistance, that if we are a collective, then you're not feeling isolated. It is about rocking a few bolts, as this practitioner says. It was time for, it was time that social workers spoke out about what was happening in Cali. This is a global issue and there is need for solidarity. So again, this is very well embedded in, in, our, um, in our values as social workers. However, despite that positiveness, there is a theme that has come out of this study about an anxiety or fear to speak out in their day job, that they're volunteering with social workers without borders on issues of asylum seekers and refugees. I wasn't expecting that. It kind of surprised me that as social workers, we would be so fearful to say, I am volunteering with social workers without borders, helping asylum seekers. And yet we can probably say happily and gladly say, I'm volunteering for a food bank. What is the difference there? Why do we feel so anxious uh, about, about these two, this setting of, 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 um, uh, of volunteering? And one of the things that comes out of this is the rhetoric around immigration and asylum, that it has been so negative, they feel not comfortable to say in their workplace, they're doing this volunteer work uh, in their spare time. And that's, that's worrying, I think, something for us too. So they become like caped crusaders doing good work in the dark of night, um, you know, and, and during the day being visible. 
Theme two, uh, it's about reinvigorating social work. So what is emerging from this study is, yes, there are some challenges in the way that these practitioners are practicing and the environment that they have, this dual uh, environment that they have to navigate, but there are also positives in going back to social work practice, kind of going back to the roots of social work. Ian Ferguson's book and work around reclaiming social work is, 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 uh, is, is a vital one here. So reinvigorating social work, why become uh, a, social, uh, a volunteer? It is really that I can go beyond my day job to make a difference. And this is a theme that comes through from these social workers that, you know, my work doesn't stop just because I leave my office at five o'clock. I can, I can make a difference elsewhere. And so that volunteering space gives them the ability or the opportunity to do that and kind of reconnect with social workers, which they feel they've, they've disconnected with local authority practice because of you know, the, the way that um, social work is, is set up in the, in the UK. It is also about value-based social work practice. There's something about value-based social work that social workers without borders really helps to promote. And a lot of the practitioners speak to the fact that actually you can speak out, you can see your voice in the news, you can see your voice in a public uh, arena, you're no longer kind of a hidden profession and social workers can lead on that, on some of uh, issues here. It is about humanizing young people and in for this practitioner, this is the sector they work in, but the fact that unaccompanied asylum-seeking children sometimes are seen as periphery to care is important to them. So value-based social work. So given that, I suppose, and reaching to my conclusion, so we can open up for a discussion here, is thinking about what is the potential for an internationalized social work? What is, an, what, is the, you know, what is social workers uh, giving us perhaps or helping us to pose as food for thought? I think this captures it really well for me, uh, this, this anecdote, which is, I suppose for me, it's getting rid of that them and us, that we're not seeing people as different uh, from us. We're not seeing asylum seekers and refugees as not worthy in the same way we might see ourselves. I'm taken back to, I think it was um, uh, the first speaker uh, about Ubuntu, uh, you know, um, this division in our communities, in our society of these people belong here, these people are citizens, but you're not a citizen. Is, is, is needs to be addressed, but also actually realizing that you've got allies in places that you might actually think is quite unlikely. And this has been central to these social workers that they've got a platform where they can be social workers. They've got, if you like, radical social workers that they can talk to, that they can work with, which doesn't seem to happen in their day job. So social work is global. Why not reach out and have a social work conversation? Our values are global, almost like a question. If they are global, why shouldn't we reach out? 